Uh, we have another, another incredible group coming up, uh, one that I'm very, very excited about. Uh, the panel is on creating a safer, saner online culture. So uh, first up is our moderator, my friend, Wall Street Journal correspondent, Joanna Stern. Woo! Next up, we have Shereen Mitchell, founder of Digital Sisters. And finally, we have Brianna Wu. She is the CEO of Giant Space Cat. Thank you, Joanna. Are we in the right seats? Yeah, I think we're in the right seats. I'm Joanna Sternley, and thank you so much for that nice intro. I am a technology journalist at the Wall Street Journal, and I think in my 10 years of covering tech, I've never been so excited for a panel, because right now, the discussion of harassment and trolling is finally in the national discourse with Reddit. Unfortunately, it is in the national discourse, and I really could not think of two better women to talk about this topic with. And I want to first introduce Brianna, though she really doesn't need much introduction. She is a game developer with tons of experience developing apps for many different mobile platforms, even Palm. Maybe she's going to write a new Palm Pilot game here. Um, but she isn't just a tech whiz. She's also a founder and an entrepreneur of her own game development company, Giant Space Cat. She also hosts an awesome podcast called Rocket, and everyone should listen to it. Not right now, but afterwards. And next is Shireen Mitchell. She is, I really can't think of anyone better to talk about the idea and the topic of trolling and threats. She is the chair of the National Council of Women's Organizations, it's a long, long organization name, and currently running the, uh, the Stop Online Violence Against Women Project. She's also founded Digital, Digital Sisters, the first organization specifically focused on bringing women of color into technology and digital media. So I want to kick off the discussion, Brianna, this is a little bit aimed at you. Uh, mm -hmm. talking, uh, we're not going to talk specifically about Gamergate, but I, sure. I, you, you told me today that you've had 108 death threats in the last nine months. Yeah. This is, uh, you know, a, a, and a, you know, some of them have been really serious. You know, this isn't, I don't even count the ones that are just go kill yourself. I mean, this is stuff like people making videos of holding like the hammer up to the camera that they plan to murder me with and telling me like, while wearing a skull mask, you'll see me in the news really soon. Like this is, you know, this is it's really horrific. terrible stuff. I mean, yeah. I, and yet you are bravely sitting here today and I wanna yeah. quote something you said because I thought it was amazing. It says, I'm doing everything I can to save my life except for be silent. What drives you to keep putting yourself out here, here today? Well, you know, I grew up in Mississippi. You know, this is um, a state with a lot of um, you know, problems with racism. It's very baked into it. And, and growing up, I saw a culture that was so unwilling to look in the mirror and solve the problems there. Um, I used to think it was a problem with, you know, Mississippians, but now I realize it's a problem with human nature because I see that same unwillingness to stand up, speak your truth, to change a culture, I see it in tech, sadly. You know, there, there are a lot of really well-meaning people that work in our field, but very few people are willing to speak up and take a stand, and I, it's about me. I could never live with myself if I was silent on this. And you know, not to push you too much on, on the threats that you've had, but you, have you seen, even in the last year, progress? I mean, do you feel like, we're going to see progress in this, in this space? You know, I feel like women have been bullied, intimidated, harassed in technology ever since its inception. You know, I think what has happened this year is it's reached such a critical point that we cannot ignore it anymore. When Anita Sarkeesian tries to speak at a, you know, a college, and people threaten the biggest school shooting in history, we can't ignore that. When I can't even live at the house that you know, I own, we can't ignore that any longer. When you, know, you have a powerful CEO of the 10th most trafficked website in the world that can't even do her job because she's getting so much misogynist harassment, that is a problem. And I think this is the year technology hit rock bottom with women, and we've gotta change it. 
And I know both of you have been involved in trying to sort of the aftermath of when these things happen, whether it's law enforcement, whether it is policing this type of content. I mean, what can be done in sort of the aftermath of when you get these threats? I mean, where is the digital restraining order, right? So basically, you know, this issue has been going on for a long time. Um, we have uh, laws out there that's focused on violence, stopping violence against women. However, they're not being applied to these issues because online is seen as different than real life. And we need to accept the fact that online and offline are the same thing. The behaviors that we see online are exactly the behaviors that we see offline. So it's not, it, to separate that, to even begin to think that those two things are different is a big problem. And so we have to get law enforcement to understand that when there is a threat, that there's, there's action that needs to be taken. And I also want to make sure that we're clear that when women of color and girls of color are attacked online or offline, they're getting the same types of attacks, but they get racism and sexism as threats. When I first went online, which is years ago, I won't tell my age, um, the, the first thing I did was to hide my identity because the minute anyone knew I was a woman or yeah. a woman of color, there was ongoing harassment. Today, this rock bottom that we see is pure volume. Mm -hmm. I've gotten it the day I, got, I turned on the switch for myself, and every young girl got that. So when I founded Digital Sisters, it was trying to help them move the needle on that and to ensure that they could you know, get online. One of the challenges that I had was to tell mothers they should let their daughters online when in actuality there were challenges with that because of predators and threats like this they were concerned about. So I had to push them to allow mm -hmm. their daughters to learn. But then now we have to realize that we now have to protect them. We, they have their voices out there. Social media has changed the game. There's 70% of women in social media right now engaging. And we need, to know, we need to know that, honestly, we need to protect them. They, they should have the same voice as anyone else. The threats are silencing women's voices. Absolutely. Can, I, can I say yeah. one quick thing to add on to that? You know, when it comes to having these kind of cases prosecuted, I've had every advantage that someone can have on this. I've been on Nightline. There was a John Oliver you know, episode that I was in a bit a while ago. You know, media all over the world has covered me. And I'm going to tell you right now, law enforcement is not getting it done. So I don't know how people that don't have access to that kind of media, right. I, they're, they're just completely invisible. And you know, this is a problem in all levels of law enforcement. There are laws that make the things that have happened to both of us very illegal, but police are not educated on the issues involved. I've had police regularly ask me what Twitter is. I had to send the FBI a hard drive of information because they could not take email, they could not take a Dropbox link. So I'm mailing the FBI an actual hard drive with this. Oh my gosh. So it's just, it is a mess. And the yeah. truth is there is no one there prosecuting this kind of stuff. It's not a priority for them. It's also not a precedent, which is the challenge yeah. that we have. Absolutely. But also, the if you remember the threats um, that happened here, unfortunately, when there were threats in social media against the police department, there was arrests made. Yes. Right? Yes. So there is precedent that we could utilize for ourselves as well. Absolutely. It should not just be a priority for certain people, yep. that when people are threatened, and, and one of the other challenges that we have is the, the concept that what's happening is just name calling or that harassment is right. basically just you know me trying to make you feel bad, but, the, but we need to understand that death threats is not a form of free speech no. and it's not protected. Yep. So when that happens, <laughs> actions should be taken. Mm -hmm. And, and it occurs to me because for many people, it's not clear what could be a real threat. And I mean, obviously, Brianna, you, you have gotten things, like you've said at the beginning of this conversation, everything from the video that is, seems very realistic to somebody just saying to you, go kill yourself. Right. Where is the line? How do people know when to feel, when, when do you know this is really something dangerous? Well, can I take a step back from that question for a second? In, you know, adding on to something you were talking about, the purpose of this is to silence us 
and to bully us into silence. You know, Massachusetts tech journalist Peter Cohen coined a phrase I really uh, appreciated. It was emotional terrorism. And I realize terrorism is a very loaded word, but that is the entire point, is to scare us, to bully us, to frighten us into silence. This is about silencing women's voices. So you know, where is the line? I think it's, it's hard to say, but I think when you're threatening people's lives, I think that that's the moment that we, we need to step in. And I think like this is a, an issue where the communities, if you're running a website where people have the ability to like congregate and create communities, you have a moral responsibility to make sure that that community is not harassing people. Reddit has completely failed on this. Twitter has completely failed on this. It is time to hold them accountable on these issues. Absolutely, I yeah. could not agree more. I, it occurs to me also, as, as I ask that question, many people in this room, and me included, you know, I don't, I, I receive comments on Facebook that are, you, you think they're, they're trolls, you think they're somewhat threatening, obviously not at the level that, that you have, but you know, I wonder many times, what am I supposed to do here? Yeah. Am I supposed to respond? Am I supposed to explain my viewpoint and what I was thinking? Am I supposed to not engage? Mm -hmm. What is the best advice for, I'm sure, many women in this room that have felt that way, whether it be in the comments section of a blog, whether it be on, on the internet, I mean, on, on Facebook or Twitter? Sure. I, I, for me, I consider myself an expert in the subject because I've tried everything. I've tried telling them to go F themselves, I've tried <laughs> arguing with them, I've tried ignoring them, I've tried blocking them, I've tried muting them. None of it works. Like there is no magical course of action you can take to not get harassed. So what I do is I don't engage. And you know, like I realize that that is, um, it's kind of asking you to be silent, but I am an engineer and I take the most pragmatic course of action I can. So. What I do is block them and I try to work within those systems to get the really bad eggs taken off. Mm -hmm. But with Twitter, it's whack-a-mole. With Reddit, it's whack-a-mole. And you know, the truth is we need law enforcement to come through to prosecute some of these cases, to put them in jail for threatening to murder us before someone actually gets murdered. And then, you know, this is so important to, to think about. In Grand Theft Auto, if I go play Grand Theft Auto V and I get a rocket launcher and I go shoot up police cars and you know, create havoc for hours, eventually I will get wasted and lose $100. For, doing, for threatening to murder women on the internet, you don't even get that. There are no consequences whatsoever. So until we introduce consequences into this equation for these people, it's going to be the same old, same old. It's time for law enforcement to step it up. I feel strongly, I'm sorry. <laughs> so the, the yeah. other issue is for every person, right? Yeah. It's different in how you handle that. It also is different in terms of your family. Right. Um, I've seen women not only threaten themselves, but people have threatened their children, has basically told them they know where their kids are. Um, and so you do, at certain levels, have to figure out what to do to protect yourself. Yeah. Um, at the same time, um, there are people who, you know, do fight back. They respond back. They um, re do as many re as reporting as possible. Twitter has stepped up a little bit now, allowing allowing uh, bystanders to actually report, report things as well. But you know, even with Twitter, I really don't agree with the concept of blocking. You know why? Because that person can still threaten right. you, put your yes. information out there, and come and, and, and have other people come after you. Yep. So blocking doesn't solve the problem. They need to be taken down, yeah. out of you know, yeah. off the system. And Twitter has the capacity of doing that. Yeah. So so the challenge that we have is the the concept that what what people are feeling is happening is that we're basically sh silencing someone else because they're just exercising their free speech. And we need to, get a, we need to address again that, that death threats is not a form of free speech. Absolutely. And, and that ultimately when this happens, when this starts to escalate, and this is the challenge about what escalation looks like, and that's what we're dealing with with law enforcement. They're trying to figure out what, when does it become a problem. It should not make it to when someone's no longer around. Um, but we do need to deal with multiple levels and, and we need multiple forms of, um, solving the yeah. problem. No, I, I, I had questions about what is on the responsibility of these platforms 
obviously read it and now feeling like they must do something. something. Twitter is doing a little bit better about that yeah. as Right, well. agreed on the block thing, it's yeah. definitely. It occurs to me both of you are entrepreneurs and have built wonderful companies and organizations. It, it, I wonder how much of that also about what's happening in the tech community stems from the lack of women in the leadership roles, right? The ones behind the scenes sort of helping drive what the culture is at these companies and that are creating these products. I mean, do you, either of you have any thoughts on how we, how that gets better? I mean, are we going to sit here in 10 years again talking about this issue of women in technology? From my perspective, the answer is yes. We will be still talking about this. I mean, when um, I was, I formed the very first web firm um, as a woman of color in Washington, D.C. in the 90s. So I was in the very early stages. And even then, I, I was the only one. And the reason why I formed Digital Sisters is because I thought we needed more women and girls into the space. But that was over 15 years ago. Over 15 years ago. What are we doing now? We're just bubbling up on the conversation about diversity in tech. It's been 15, for me, it's been 15 years. So how do we change that? Yeah. We, we do have to keep pushing that envelope, but your, the answer to your question is yes. We need more women in the leadership positions to make decisions so that we have a more diverse structure. The reason, and I've done training with tech companies trying to deal with diversity issues there, mm -hmm. and I've had people say, I just want me in a female body, or I just want me with darker skin, which is ridiculous, because that means that you're just looking for yourself. Yeah. So I say things like this. Let's just say God broke the mold when he made you, or she made you. <laughs> so we need a different mold coming in the door. And it's not going to look like you. Yep. And then we start to move the, the agenda. But it takes, it takes a second for people to realize that, the, that they're perpetuating a culture that is similar like themselves. And what diversity really looks like it's yeah. not looking at a mirror. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a syndrome in tech that, um, you know, Ernest Klein just put out a new book, Armada. I'm going to call it Armada Syndrome. So Armada is a book that's, it's 100% a geek fantasy. And there, it's a bunch of white dudes, like, going and having this ultimate geek empowerment adventure. And then, you know, women and people of color are just barely there. And it's not that that author set out to not include other people. It's just like he kind of sees himself as like the culture and he writes about what interests him. This is tech culture. Like it's not that people are sitting there consciously saying, I don't want women at my company. It's that they're just unconsciously looking for people that look like them. So it's a huge problem. It frustrates me to know and that I am better known as a feminist figure than I am as an entrepreneur. Right. I mean, I work my butt off developing software. This is a really hard job. But the truth is, I can't stay silent because this is a question if I get to continue in this field. So, you know, with all respect to the people working at Reddit, because I do know engineers on that team, you're not gonna change Reddit culture into a place that's safe for women. I think the odds of success of that are non-existent. So what we need is women going out there, starting our own companies. We need women working within the frameworks to rise up to the leadership. We need women and you know, people of color and people of different sexualities. You know, we need to be, step up and fight to be included. I think it is a moral fight to make sure that we're included. And I want to say one thing here. You know, engineers build societies. That's what we did in Rome with the aqueducts. You know, it's what we do when we build, you know, malls or planes. When we are building, you know, the software for social media or games, this is where we as humans inhabit. This is where we spend our time. I spend a lot more time on Twitter than I do at my local civic center. This is a question if women get included in building the future of the human race, and it is incredibly important. And you said something, and you said something there, and you said something earlier where, uh -huh. I, I think, Shireen, you said it, where there's no difference between our online lives and our real lives. We need to act the same in both places. And I wonder how. Like, how do we educate children 
and even adult, I mean, people in general, humans, to act like they would online as they would when they are, you know, going to a store. I mean, obviously not, there, there are assholes in this world and there are bad people in this world, but people think they hide behind a computer and they can be someone else. And it goes back to the anonymity thing. You didn't want to be who you were. People want to be different people online. How, how do we do that? I think it's repetition. I mean, something I do a lot in my Twitter and my public presence is I try to get you know, the traditional white, male, straight, cisgender dude to kind of check their privilege and to realize, like, you know, it's nothing personal to you, but, you know, there are other people that play games. Like, this isn't your culture, it's our culture. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think what it is is constantly stepping up and saying, like, hey, you know what, this panel, you didn't invite any people of color. Hey, you know what, this game, you don't have any women in this. Hey, you know, this media, this is problematic. You haven't, you know, included anyone. Hey, this movie is transphobic. Let's, like, talk about including other people in there. And I think it's constantly repeating that. And when we bring it up, we're going to be shouted down. We're going to be told it's not important because they're so privileged and feel like they own the entire culture that the absence of privilege feels like oppression to them. And mm -hmm. while my heart bleeds for that tragic situation, <laughs> I think we've got to stay with it because the only way this is going to get better is when all of us feel safe to share our lived experiences. Yeah. So, I, you know, I want to go back to, oops, sorry. <laughs> so I also want to go back to the concept that, you know, even with games, originally, you know, when we go, well, let me not tell myself again about the game I used to play, <laughs> but Honestly, one of the biggest games that everyone knows is called Pac-Man from back in the day, right? There's, there will always be a Pac-Man story, right? If but, someone doesn't know Pac-Man, you have to leave. You have to leave. So I just told myself in terms of age. But one thing about that was the designer was actually thinking, because um, there's, there's like whole communities that love still talk about Pac-Man, and I sometimes do that too, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> But one of the things about Pac-Man, and it, it was like a world changer in terms of the game, was also, it was, a, it was a gender change, right? It became sort of, uh, you know, we had a, 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 a little icon that was a guy, supposedly. However, the designer actually designed that game trying to get more girls included in gaming. So that was the original thought process. Hmm. And that happened. Girls started playing more, including myself, so if we actually think about the successes that we've had and get people to understand that we can change the narrative, so then it became you know, Miss Pac-Man, Junior Pac-Man, Pirate Pac-Man. Yeah, I, I played it a lot. <laughs> um, but, the, but the thought of this, these iterations are really possible. You can be more inclusive. When we had Space Invaders, there, were no, there was no gender with Space Invaders. But we have the games like what you produce mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. produce. There's nothing wrong with having that level of diversity. And I yeah. think at the end of the day, it, we're better for it. We, we get to include more people. We get to have um, different perspectives of a, a particular game. We get better games. Um, so, in, so in the end, we get better products. So we need to still push the narrative that, yes, we need more women at the table. Yes, we need more diverse perspectives on that. But we also, I want to make sure that people don't think that this is like, we just need numbers. We, this is just quota. There's no such thing as a woman going through wanting to be in tech and, and dealing with all the things that she has to go through to just stay in that door, that she's not coming with quality, with, with diversity, and, and a, a real passion for the, for the field. And we should accept that as the narrative that we should move forward, instead of having people trying to push women, especially women and girls of color, out the door. When I walk into a room that happens to be filled with mostly white men, they're usually looking at me wondering why I'm there. That has to change. Yep. Yep. Okay, can I add one quick thing onto that? Yeah, as I understand it, women's money, like you can spend it just like men's money. And there are <laughs> women are lined up desperate to spend money on movies that include us, on video games that doesn't have us as the helpless damsel in distress or yes. the bimbo wearing a chain meal bikini. 
Like, we are so desperate for this. And we, like, it, it, the business case shows over and over and over that there's so much money to be made here. So I am a feminist, but I'm also an entrepreneur. There is so much money to be made by taking women seriously. Yeah. So. For me, the question always comes back to how. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, and I love these panels because it gets people brainstorming how can these things be pushed ahead? I mean, and, and you've been through it. You've been through raising money. You've been yeah. through venture capital. Yeah. I mean, is there a secret? Is there a way to get taken seriously? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is going to have a little bit of critique here, but we're all adults here. Um, I think sometimes, you know, we get here because we see that there's a problem of representation, right? There's a problem in the game industry I see right now where the primary feature of the game that we tend to put forward is the diversity. And mm -hmm. diversity is super important. Like, this is why I work with at my studio all the time. But you have to have a good game first. So I think that we need to be utterly pragmatic and realistic about this. I think sometimes, um, I think sometimes we cannot be as pragmatic about what we're trying to achieve. So, you know, when I go into meetings with venture capitalists, you know, the business case is a slam dunk. Like, anyone that looks at our business plan and doesn't understand there's a lot of money to be made, they don't need to be in the money-making business. Like, you know, but it's, it's like being very pragmatic about what you're trying to do. So, you know, um, I was talking to Susanna Polo of uh, Polygon uh, two nights ago. I had dinner with her and a bunch of Mary Sue people, and she said something that was so striking to me. You know, she said, you know, when a woman goes out into the world and she puts on a business suit to, you know, make money and to provide jobs to her team, to me, that's like wearing a superhero suit. And I really agree with that. Like, this is a moral cause to get in there and change the world. So I think, I think the how is to have um, multiple people trying to move the narrative. Um, I, I can't remember, I think her name was Janice. Um, she had the very first um, um, voice activated game and it was under her company called Girl Tech. She mm -hmm. actually, um, you know, she used her credit, you know, she was in debt before that game would, before she got it to be sold. And the challenge that we have is, when someone's shopping a product around, she came from another company where, the, where she had produced these types of products. But when they finally bought the product, they changed it and they um, actually changed the advertising towards boys. It was actually a gender neutral game. So that was an example where you can see that even when someone does do the work, that there are some challenges you know, in terms of how to move that needle. I think that more and more um, women producing quality products, despite how it gets packaged, that we get to say, you know, tell the stories. Because the other challenge that we have is the stories are not being told about women who are doing very successful yes. things and successful games mm -hmm. and actually producing something. Yeah. Um, we expect to hear about a guy doing that. We need to hear more and more of these stories. That's the yeah. beginning of how. Because then the VCs see products that um, can, you know, companies and products that are headed by women, designed by women, that they feel they can put their money behind. And in DC, um, there was a startup challenge called um, Women Startup, Women Tech Startup, who has also begun to have sort of this conversation and move that needle about getting women funded. Um, but also, Kathy Finney has um, been pushing the needle with one of her projects about um, seeing women of color in the tech industry as entrepreneurs. And we need to see more and more of those stories. I mean, women are flat out being erased yes. in video game history. I was watching, there's a Netflix uh, documentary called Video Game the Movie or something like that. And they brought in all the people that they found historically significant from the Pong era to today. Practically no women whatsoever. Yeah, I know for a fact, because like yeah. I know this history. Like women worked on these teams. Women were at Sega. Women have like really been there behind the scenes doing this. But our stories are just erased. Yes. And I you agree. can't be it if you can't see it. And I just I think like we have to stand up and like stop that from happening. I, I totally agree. Yeah. It, even the I think this the this the I think she was the COO of Tinder, they basically erased her from um, the whole history. It, it, so that yep. kind of stuff 
Do you remember that? Yes. That kind of stuff is the type of stuff that we need to call out yep. because evidently that product was not put to the forefront without a woman behind it, and yet most of us don't even know her name. And I mean, it goes to what you're also experiencing, yes. right? The idea is they're trying to stamp women out of the gaming culture sure. by by harassing. Yeah. I assume, and I, you have, you've written about that, you get emails from younger women who feel scared. And yeah. to them, I mean, it, many people in here might feel scared. Like, I don't want to be involved in this discussions because it could mean for me harassment. It could mean terrible yes. things and comments coming at me. How does that stop? I mean, isn't that, I mean, you're obviously fighting the fight. You're on yeah. the battle lines. You're yeah. on the, the battle lines. the front ground. line. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's me and Nita Sarkeesian, Zoe Quinn, and a few other women that are, you know, we're really tanking for the whole team here. Um, you know, I would love to sit here and give you a super inspirational message and tell you to encourage your young daughters to get involved in games. Because, like, my job, I sometimes do it, and I am... Um, so in wonderment about what I get to do for a living. But yeah, you know, I have a friend of mine, Elizabeth Sampat, and she's um, a game designer at PopCap. And yeah, you know, she recently has made a decision to stop. She doesn't feel like it's ethical to encourage young women to mm -hmm. enter the mm -hmm. game industry because you will experience horrific stuff. You will get harassment. Like, and I mean, sexual harassment stories, career discrimination, like, she really struggles with that. And, you know, I get letters from girls who are scared and excited and just want to believe it's going to be better. So, you know, I'm not going to do what Elizabeth is doing. You know, I'm going to get in there, and I swear I'm going to make it better for your daughters. I promise you, when they enter this field 10 years from now, it's going to be better. Thank you. I... I, I also say that, you know, we cannot discourage, we need more girls, we cannot, I know that this can be a discouraging conversation, but we need more girls, particularly more girls of color, in, in, in all of these spaces. And, and once we get that volume, some of this will change, but I also want to make sure that the reason that Stop Online Violence Against Women um, um, campaign is here is to, to highlight all the projects out there that actually are trying to stop this. There's trollbusters.com, troll-busters.com, one project by Michelle Feria out in, out in Ohio who's actually working on some, some projects there. We have Heart Mob um, coming out of um, I Holla Back. Um, we also have um, other projects like Zoe's Crash Override. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are, there's volumes of organizations and people like me who are committed to stopping this because we need that safe space for women. Yeah. But I also want to be clear that not everyone can be on the front line, yeah. and I'm okay with that. Yes. Yes. And they should be okay with yes. that. Understand, self-care is the most important part of this, and you cannot move this needle and help move us further if you don't feel, feel good about what you're doing. Absolutely. And you, and you can't yeah. encourage girls, honestly. I still encourage those girls, but, I'm, what, what I, but what I'm doing now is trying to stop their harassment so they can freely enjoy themselves, learn these new tools, and get into a space that I love. Yeah. I was 10 years old when I fell in love with tech and gaming. 10 years old. I'm still here, and I still love it, even though mm -hmm. it's difficult. But it can be done, and we can do something about it. So these campaigns that I'm working on, these organizations I work with, they're all here to help us deal with this, and we are gonna move this needle, and we're also gonna push legislation and law enforcers to do something about this so that women and girls do feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do feel sometimes when we discuss this issue that there's a lot of concentration on supporting young girls getting interested in tech, yeah. and that's so important. It's a very critical component of that. And let me just completely agree with what you're saying. Like, I don't need you to be on the front line. There are any number of ways you can support this. There are plenty of women in the game industry that don't talk about you know, these issues and just do an awesome job every day, and that is great. You, know, you can do it that way. There's so many ways you can stand up for this cause. But I think a fallacy that we as women are encouraged to make is to kind of bet on the next generation and not really work yeah. on ourselves. Yeah. And I'm completely unwilling to do that. My focus is 100% on women that are in this field right now. 
And you know, for the women out there that are working in this field alongside me, I want to make it better for the next generation by making it better for us. Right. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I mean, the, the reality is we can't sit back. No. no we, none of us can The stakes sit back. are too high. The stakes are too high. Yeah. This is too important. And the reality is the, the reason why we're getting so much pushback is because we are doing something yeah. about it. We are pushing the envelope. Yeah. And we need to keep pushing. We need to push back. And in and, and, and many ways, this online harassment is the pushback on us. Yeah. And we just need to say, I, we don't care. We're still coming. Yeah. Just you know, get comfortable. Right. But we're coming. Yeah. They gave me everything they had. I'm still here. I'm not going <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> Like, what, you're going to call me a bitch on Twitter? I don't, like, I don't even blink at that anymore. Like, you know, like, it's, you get the real truth is, and I'm not going to tell you, like, it is horrifying the things that have happened to me this year. And, you know, I've, I'm in therapy about it, and it's every time I get a knock on the door, you know, my heart races a little bit because I worry it's that guy with the skull mask there to kill me. At the same time, for most of these people, they have no power. You know, I make video games, they make internet comments. You know, who's got the power in the industry? So, you know, like, I, I really, I really believe that for all of us, you know, I know it's hard to push past that fear and to put yourself out there. I know it, I get it. But my message to you is like, if you can do that and believe in yourself and stay in this field and speak your truth, I promise you, I will be standing there right beside you, changing this, I promise. I'll leave it no. at that. No. <laughs> um, actually, my last question was gonna be, yeah. what can people in this room do, even if we're not doing the most impactful stuff that you guys are doing, and I asked this question for me, what can I do to push this agenda forward, to be, to make this place a safer place like you said, for us right now, but obviously the generations after us. Right. I think, I think one of the things that we need to remember is that, you know, we all not only experience some form of this, but we see it. And as bystanders, we should yeah. be saying something. And if, if more, if we get the, the pushback the other way, that, that this type of behavior is unacceptable from society, because it's online, and we're as bystanders are saying that on a daily basis could also help move that needle. Like just okay. just the one time when even for me, sometimes I see a tweet and someone says they feel like they're being threatened. I say, point me to where it's coming from, and and I say that personally because the reality is there is something I can do. I can't I can't stop it all, but if I see something that's happening, I will report it. I will I ensure that they know where to go for resources if necessary. And if we all do that, we can start pushing that needle as well. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, I think for you, because you're in media, um, you know, it doesn't matter to an extent what I do in my role as, you know, making software if the media that reviews it and decides what's important is so male dominated that they don't care. You know, a lot of times the work I do, which is m about making games with narrative, with powerful, awesome women, you know, it's kind of dismissed as, oh, it's that girl game by that mm -hmm. studio of women. You know, so we need you doing exactly what you're doing. Um, yeah, I talked to you on the phone yesterday. You were talking about how um, uh, you wrote a review about a really giant Android Wear watch. Mm -hmm. And in your review, you stood by and you said, this watch is a little bit clunky for women. You know, that is a perspective that we need. Yeah. When Wall Street Journal is primarily covering men and startups by men, we need women journalists there saying, hey, is this the whole story here? Are we kind of being lazy, you know? Are we really including people of color and startups by women, you know? Like, we need women in media doing this. We also need entrepreneurs like me out there. And, you know, we need feminist leaders like you, like kind of bringing a coalition of everyone together. We are like an RPG party. We all have our own specific role. And, you know, we'll go out there and we're going to beat the final boss. I love it. Well, yeah. thank you guys so much. This is such a, I mean, crazy enlightening conversation. Yeah. Work. Thank you. This was an yeah. awesome conversation. Yeah.
really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, having worked in digital journalism myself since 1995, I was just soaking it all in, um, and having worked in news. Uh, thank you. Great conversation. You can't be it if you can't see it. There are so many things to tweet. Um, th thank you, Joanna, for moderating. Um, I didn't have to do All just a round of applause.